Testing, testing. Not quite midnight. Seven minutes. Let's see here.
So say hello. Okay. Hey, everybody. Now, you're probably wondering what that photograph is. I had to take get the... Hopefully, there's no feedback. If there's feedback, let me know. Please let me know if the sound is better, too, okay? But how is everyone doing? Now, if I go back to the watch page, um, uh, not hearing anything? Here? Hearing? Not hearing? Are you not hearing? Or can you hear? Or can you hear? Let me try something else here. Um, let's see. You hear me? Okay, you hear me. Okay, great. Awesome. Awesome. Ooh, okay, cool. All right. Now, welcome to the second show, Zenny 62 Live. Still getting the hang of this. I am actually not using my smartphone. I'm using an encoder. I'm using... Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. I'm using a Wirecast encoder. So, awesome. Awesome. Now, let's get... Let's cut right to the chase because... I want to have some fun with this one. I don't want to have fun at this man's expense, okay? But I got to show you this, folks. You're wondering... All right. That was Charles Oakley. You can hear me now, right? That was Charles Oakley. Oh, I get it. Okay, so there's no sound on camera, too. Okay, that's good to know. Okay, that's good to know. All right. That guy, that was Charles Oakley. With that picture that you saw there, that was Charles Oakley. And what Charles Oakley was doing was he was pointing a finger like this, okay? He was pointing a finger like this at the security guard. And... Yeah, yeah, I did that. I was showing you the picture with Charles Oakley. But he had a, he was pointing a finger at a New York Knicks rep. And what happened was that he went to the New York Knicks Clippers game. And what he, he, he tried to talk to, to James Dolan. James Dolan is the owner of the New York Knicks. And what happened was that Mr. Dolan wasn't having any of, Oakley's behavior, cool, and and so Oakley was so excited to be so close to a guy that he had been trying to get meetings with for years, and said that as many as fifteen people had been trying to set up a meeting for him, that he got a little excited, and so Mr. Dolan called security, and security comes over now. You know, any sensible person would, at this point, think, you know what, he doesn't want me around, okay? So maybe I better get out of here. But we're talking about Charles Oakley, and I don't know if, I don't think Charles Oakley was high on anything. I think Charles Oakley is just playing mad, all right? Charles Oakley is old school basketball. He'd get in your face, he'd elbow you a little bit, he'd rough you up, actually he'd elbow you a lot. He was part of the enforcer group of the 90s. The Bill Lambeers and those guys, okay? And so anyway, Oakley didn't like how he was being treated by the New York Knicks public relations people, the security guard, and there was a cop standing there, all these, you know, sh white guys shorter than he. And so he takes his finger and he drills into one of the guys like that, all right? And that started everything. So the cop... The guy goes back to try to put his hands on Dole, on on Oakley, and Oakley says, "Get out of here! I'm not having any of that." And then the cop comes around. He pushes the cop. This is all on tape. Charles Oakley completely went bonkers. He went off. It took seven guys to escort him off the court and out of the way. And as this is going on, you have. Knicks 
fans, all right? Throughout Madison Square Garden cheering, Oakley, Oakley, Oakley. A hilarious scene. The Knicks have performed so poorly that what James Dolan should have done was signed Charles Oakley up to a 10-day contract. That would have made all the difference in the world. But instead of, you know, instead of doing that, what does the Knicks PR organization do on Twitter? They write, they, they say, and I'm paraphrasing right now, oh, Charles Oakley came to the game tonight and he was aggressive and belligerent and he had to be escorted out and arrested and charged with assault. And I quote, and I quote, okay? And this is what they wrote. This is on Twitter, folks. And we hope he gets the help he needs. <laughs> okay? Which is really interesting because, you know, during the days that Charles Oakley played, there were a couple of, there was about a month or so he played with a broken jaw, but no one from the Knicks suggested that he get help when he, you know, for playing with a broken jaw at that time, right? Think about it. So, you know, What's going to happen with Charles Oakley? Well, he's been charged three assaults, which is horrible. You know, you just you just want to, you feel for the man because, all right, what's the story behind all of this? Well, years of mistreatment by the Knicks. Now I don't mean mistreatment like they held him in a room or something like that. Just contractually, relationally, and Charles Oakley felt he never got his due and he wanted to... Just talk to Mr. Dolan about it. Talk to James Dolan. James kept rebuffing him. Ah, yeah, you know. And that's that's what happened. So uh, he's got... It's very lame. Yeah. Um, Trey saying that's lame. It's completely lame. It's completely lame of James Dolan to do that. He didn't need to. And he didn't... James Dolan didn't take care of an acknowledged NBA legend. But also, and something else that was absolutely true and absolutely hilarious... Charles Oakley put up more fight than any New York Knicks has since, jeez, I can't remember. It's been a long time since we actually seen, saw a Nick that fight. I thought maybe Chris Stapps for Singa, right? But, you know, he's got these great games, and then once in a while he turns into a small snowflake. Uh, not referring to the fact that he's, you know, Polish or anything. He just crumbles, all right? And so he, <laughs> you're like, wow, this guy, poor Singa is going to be the best, the, the next best thing since sliced bread, and then, no, he's not. And then he's streaky. Charles Oakley would break your face. In fact, you know, come Charles Oakley almost broke some faces tonight. <laughs> Just being honest. Now, uh, so this, I remember Patrick Ewing. Yeah, I remember that too. I remember Patrick Ewing as a Nick. And these were the days when uh, these fellows played rough. And yet they, I mean, they really seriously played rough. I'm talking even Magic Johnson and Larry Bird and Isaiah Thompson. Wow, I mean, they took no prisoners. Today, by comparison, the cupcakes. Forget it. It's cupcakes. But Charles Oakley's day, these guys, they would definitely break your jaw. That's how they were. They were rough. So, hopefully the Knicks see the light, get him out of jail, and because I think the way it's going to work, though, yeah, we played, that was right, that's right, um, Mark says we played rough, that was the NBA, that's right, remember the Chief, Robert Parrish, played with the Warriors for a while, then the Celtics, mild-mannered, he'd come after you, too, these guys were serious. They, they were serious. The only problem with the NBA in those days was the shorts are too short. You know? Look stupid. <laughs> that, that was it. I mean, now the women should wear the shorts that the NBA dudes wore in, in you know, the 90s and the 80s and the 70s. You know what I'm saying? The, N the WNBA ought to have those, those shorts. I'm, I'm serious about that. Their ticket sales are going through the roof. It'll be incredible. Be incredible. Yeah. Robert Parrish, okay? It'd be incredible. Absolutely. Absolutely incredible. So I but now you've got all right, and I think I think someone says uh 
nut hugger. Yeah, yeah, basically. But you want to, instead of the nut hugger, you would kind of want them on women to be the, you know, other kind of hugger. But the whole point is. <laughs> but don't you think so? I mean, don't you think WNBA women should have their own style? I brought this. I have to say this. I have to get this out of the way. I brought this to the attention of Ann Warner Cribs. You're probably saying, who's Ann Warner Cribs? Ann is a friend of mine, 1960 Olympian. That's right, 1960 Olympian. But her more modern claim to fame, aside from trying to bring the Olympics to the San Francisco Bay Area, was uh, she started the women's version of the ABA. And I went down when I worked for L.U. Harris and uh, as economic advisor when I was trying to bring the Super Bowl to Oakland, I went down and had lunch with her in Palo Alto, and I openly said, yeah, you know, the WNBA and the ABA should have, like, short shorts because, you know, guys want to see women at their best, but they want to see the women, you know, looking great with legs and everything. She looked at me like this. I kid you not. I thought she was... <laughs> I said, someone says, uh, oh, Zinni, a lot of WNBA women look like men, the men, that's just a fact. Well, okay, look, some of them, maybe that's a matter of opinion, but I want to see women dressed like the women. I mean, how do you know if, if, they're, if they're dressed like guys, then yeah, okay, fine. Uh, Nancy Lieberman's kind of cute, I think. That's me, all right? And then you've got, uh, my, um, my gosh, remember Lisa Leslie? Or how about uh, Maya or um, Sue Bird? I like Sue Bird, okay? And okay, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I always said I. I said they'd like to look like men. Oh, I got <laughs> gotcha, <laughs> gotcha, Mr. Howard. <laughs> got it. <laughs> That's pretty good. Right, right, right. But the bottom line is, hey, uh, that ought to be the future of the WNBA. I really believe that. I mean, hey, if you're talking about women's sports, go support Bay Area Roller Derby. I'm just saying. $120 season ticket, $30 gift pack, an unpaid, unsolicited, you know, plug for the great women who roller derby. But I digress, all right? Now, back to my point regarding Charles Oakley. Charles Oakley is in trouble. And, you know, the heck with the Knicks for treating him that way. It really is. Uh, and someone says, uh, it works in golf. Yeah, thank you. It works in golf. What's the lady, the tall Asian... Uh, Michelle Wee, oh my god, six foot two, I mean, legs for days, oh, yeah, someone put a plug for the SF Bay Area Bombers for roller derby, yes, absolutely, but absolutely, how come that can't be the case for the WNBA, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, all right, just, just asking, all right, yeah, exactly, all right, now, it's closing in on 12.15, I want to shift gears from Oakley, and um, I hope he, I hope the Knicks, in closing with this, I hope the Knicks really, really do get, uh, get help. I really do. Now, for, and I hope they get help for him, and treat him like the legend that he is. Obviously, there's something going on in his life that drove him to this point, but to be the engineers of his downfall, I think is a terrible thing. I, I really hope they, they help him out. Now, before I get to the stuff that we really want to talk about, you know, I got to get this whole George Lopez thing out of the way. And by the way, has anyone seen, I haven't seen anything on the Ninth Circuit Court deal, but hold on a second, has a question here. What do you think about the NFL in Europe? I'll get to that in a second. George Lopez did a comedy routine and where he said that, how did I have it, Latinos don't date blacks and they don't do something else. And some a black woman in the audience said something well, inappropriate to him, and Lopez shot back and called her the B-word. That's wrong. That's wrong. And not only that, if it's wrong, okay, here's here's my issue. Does anybody out there remember Michael Richards from uh, Seinfeld? All right? Because if you remember Michael Richards from Seinfeld, you remember, um, someone says, I saw Lopez in L.A. stand up, not a nice guy. Hates anyone not his race. See, that's not a cool thing, all right? Yeah, Kramer. Remember Kramer? Kramer went off, started using the N-word to an audience, da-da-da. 
and that's it. He ruined his career, right? So why does George Lopez get off? I'm just saying, because he's Latino, I don't care. And no, I'm not, you know, like a conservative Republican type of guy. Some people think I am, but I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm just saying, though, that that's, you know, you don't do that. And when I saw George Lopez going off like that, I thought of, I thought of Kramer. I thought of Michael Richards. And I thought, why is it wrong for him and it's okay for George Lopez? It's not okay. Maybe that's his shtick, okay? Maybe it's his shtick, but it's not right for him to do. I, I, you know, I, that, that was not something that settled with me. Now, someone would say that the best comedy is the most offensive comedy. But, uh, okay, you, you, you get what you pay for, maybe. But is, to me, good comedy is Bill Cosby comedy. And no, I don't mean, <laughs> what he's going through is not funny, all right? But Bill Cosby could be funny without cursing or putting anyone down. He could take life stories, and he could take the story, something that happened to him, and make you laugh about it. Similarly, remember Paula Poundstone? She made funny out of depression, in a sense, there was, oh, you've got other people today, well, Trevor Noah, of course. Then you've got the news comedy people like Stephen Colbert and the legendary Jon Stewart, right? There are all kinds of ways to be funny without putting someone down. In fact, it's better to put down a president <clears throat> than, you know, some bystander who's trying to make their rent who came to the audience, into the audience to hear you just in the hopes that maybe they could laugh and you know, feel better about life. So now that poor soul and so has got to go out and on top of whatever problems they're dealing with, they've got to deal with being kicked out of a comedy club because they thought that what Lopez said was offensive. It's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. And someone says here, a lot of comics that become big let their egos get the best of them. Absolutely. They really, you know, they really do that. And it's, it's a horrible habit that I hope people stop doing we stop promoting on on the other hand though george lopez one could argue knew what he was doing from a social media perspective and thought okay i'll go off on this lady it'll go viral and you know to get me some pub there is a school that says there's no such thing as bad press all right and i understand that school is if you consider the fact that we've got a president that you know seems to thrive on making his own bad press that's absolutely the case. But how far are we going to go with this stuff? You know? I mean, it would be nice if George came out. And, and, and yeah, there is a mean-spiritedness to him, that unquestionably. But I think the same punishment that was exacted upon Kramer should fall upon George Lopez. I think that's just right. I think that's fair. I think he should receive the same type of criticism, the same type of... of blather from people and it's right that he is criticized it's right that he's put down and this idea why is it that someone latino feels like they have to put down someone black i mean or is it just the guys because maybe they're mad that, that maybe a latino woman wants to be a black guy i mean there's a lot of hot latino women but at any rate why do that especially when you consider you have two groups that um Blacks and Latinos that have so much in common in terms of socioeconomic status and shared experiences that you would think the, the fusing is better than it looks like it is. I mean, I, and well, from a standpoint of interracial dating, it actually is pretty good. But in total, it should be a better fusing than it is. But why that is is a whole other set of conversations we could have maybe it has something to do with the idea that when you are how do i say this when some people when one person views the other as just that the other they don't see the commonalities they see why they shouldn't be with them it's an irrationality that has come to define american society that i'm ha happy to say is diminishing particularly after this year, look at all the commercials that are interracial. Isn't it beautiful? I mean, all kinds of combinations. Finally, we've gotten there. Finally. It's fantastic. 
in 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 some um, Paul says, what about Don Rickles? He's considered a legend. You know, I love Don Rickles, but Don Rickles is different. Don Rickles didn't call you the B word. I mean, he might call you a hockey puck, but he made insults that were kind of like because they weren't commonly the terms he used weren't commonly vulgar in society. All right, he may made you laugh, and he might talk about something you did but it was it wasn't mean it didn't come off like he really meant for you to be pissed off he didn't come like like he was trying to say the b word now rick yeah rickle spares no one and anyone who goes to this show knows not to sit close to stage if they can't fake it right insults are part of his stick but it's a different kind of insult you know it's not and i i love don rickles since i was 12 okay six now, um, Barry Lee says it's probably why Lopez can't get a show on a network because of his comments. And America's starting to become less cynical. Yeah, that's true. But Don, Don Rickles, I thought, was the master. I mean, the master at, at insulting you and making you laugh at the same time. Because you know, there's something in his heart and the way he said it and the words that he used. You know he didn't mean it. Okay? He wasn't really... He would always say it, I don't believe, you know. But... Then he'd pick at your hair or something like that. It was funny. He meant to be funny. George Lopez means to be mean. That's the vast difference, okay? That's the vast difference. Yeah, it's a different kind of insult. It's a different kind of insult. All right. I want to talk about, I want to shift gears to the Raiders, and I want to talk about the one thing that, frankly speaking, I don't want to talk about, but it's out there. First of all, before I say anything else, Mark Bedane is he's got a back problem. Mark Bedane's the Raiders president. So prayer for Mark Bedane because he's having a back procedure done this week as I speak. And um and he uh and no how are you quite right? Yeah. But uh, uh Paul you're quite right. But at any rate, um but um, Don someone says Don Knotts was a classy guy. He was. But as far as Bedane, Bedane has a back procedure and that's caused meetings that he was going to have this week to be shifted, all right? So this is, from that perspective, a slow week for the Raiders. However, people looking at their draft boards and heating them up, and I'll be able, tomorrow I'm going to talk more about the NFL draft for the Raiders. But I'm kind of stalling in my comments because, oh, I hate this. Oh, San Diego? I mean, come on. I'm not buying this, okay? I mean, I'm going to write this. San Diego, I'm not buying it. Let's see. I mean, look, okay. San Diego. San Diego. No. San Diego. Raiders? L-O-L. -L. See that? San Diego Raiders. L-O-L. -L. Oh. Um, Octavius says, from Panama, an Latin country was 30% black population, but 75% mix. The very the way to end racial prejudice, we must accept who we are regardless of race. Quite right. Quite right. You're absolutely right. Now, Mark Bedane, yeah, pray for Mark. And Bedane, no, he's, he, it's, you know, as far as Bedane, look, I have some of the same back problems. And I was going to write to Mark, hey, the best way to, to, to solve them is by rowing, indoor rowing. I do indoor rowing. I lost 20 pounds. I lost 28 pounds indoor rowing last year. I highly recommend it. I love it. I love it, okay? Thank you, uh, Golden State Raider. And by the way, Golden State Raider, I'll have t-shirts for purchase by Monday, if not sooner, and I'll announce them on the live stream. Thank you. Now, um, here's the thing, okay? As far as Mark Bedane, the, uh, it's, the entire Raider schedule has shifted. But as far as this, yeah, the San Diego thing, you know, I'm gonna some people, I'm just gonna say some people, they kinda like um putting stuff out there just to keep it's called clickbait, right? Um it's called clickbait. And uh, they they do this just to keep you excited. Like one one like okay, Vinny Bonsiori of the LA Daily News. I like Vinny. Okay, I've got nothing personally against Vinny, so I'm gonna talk about him. But let me say one thing about Vinny. Vinny, let me say a number of things about Vinny, okay? First of all, Vinny's a good guy. I know that he always says um, why, I know he always says 
that, and I'll talk about Fortress in a second, but Vinny is a good guy, but you have to understand that this is a competitive business. I mean, there are people like me, and you have Jason, you've got all, you have more people out there doing this, even some of you, and doing it well, I might add, than ever before. And so rather than having the nice little ring where we all sing Kumbaya, you have you know, some people who backbite and talk about others. We have other people who have their strategy, and Vinny's strategy has been to, and this is a, a game, it's to upset you, okay? Now, Vinny would never admit to it because he doesn't like the what the result and the result is that you know, yeah John Mark says Vinny is the troll king and that and Mr. K Park says Vinny never 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 that's his source right and um and hey I'll see you uh Noah come back please all right thank you for staying and uh and I'll get to that Rita Kuko all right peace Noah I'll see you um anyway the point that I'm making about Vinny is that Vinny does not like being attacked on Twitter. He takes it personally. Okay, he's asked me about a couple of people who've done it. I've already talked to those people. This is months in the past, all right? But he takes it personally. Um, I tried to explain to him that the way... We had this conversation. It was a last year's NFL draft, all right? And I was trying to explain to him that the way people think, social media is the, the, the most... the best way that they can get close to you, Vinny, and express to you how they feel about what you write. They don't mean to put you down, but sometimes you say things that upset them, okay? Now, Vinny hates that. He blocks certain people, but then he turns around and he does it again, right? So you've got to think, all right, he's not running his own organization. He works for somebody else, and they're probably turning him, excuse me, I know, they're telling him to stir the pot. All right. Why? Because what happens is that people end up talking about him. And when someone when you talk to somebody else about Vinny and that person talks to someone else about Vinny, then along that chain of people talking about Vinny, one of them at least is going to see what Vinny has to say. And then maybe if they don't like it, the chain continues, right? You see that's the game, okay? So, <laughs> Bill says, that's an understatement. Hey, Hugh, how you doing? Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. That's an understatement, all right? But that's the game. I don't like playing that game. I don't like to just tell you things just to stir your, to get your pot stirred or anything else. I like to say something that is based on something that happened or something, information that I got. For example, with Bedane, if I wanted to be that person rather than telling you, hey, Mark Bedane's, you know, getting a back procedure, let's pray for Mark Bedane, I would have made up something. I would have said, oh, well, the Raiders are doing this. Blah, blah, blah. No. All right? All right? Now, someone says, uh, I think Jason Cole and Vinny should go the WWE as the tag team. I When I was at Charlotte at the NFL owners meeting, I tried to get them all at the same time, but I couldn't quite line it up. But I did get both of them for an interview. Um, and then, uh, now, as far as the, the 15... Well, as far as the, the Fortress news, okay? Fortress is working hard. They're being silent. There are... There's information that I know that I cannot tell you. I'll repeat that. There's information that I know that I cannot tell you. That's where we're at. I can say that the stars are aligning very well. Someone asked me the other night if I felt the ultimate end game would be the, for the Raiders to not file for relocation. And I listed the possible scenario where that could happen. And that scenario is slowly unfolding. Now, wait. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm saying there's a scenario. Now, as far as the Faritas are concerned in, in the Las Vegas, let's, let's, let's think about something, all right? Let's let's think about something, okay? First of all, Vinny may have put it out there that there's a source, one source, unidentified, that says, oh, the Raiders are going to San Diego, just like he said the Raiders are going to Las Vegas, just like he said the Raiders are going to Carson. Boy, it's getting add up. Did he, did he throw San Antonio in the mix? But at any rate, 
just because he says that, what it means, what it should tell you is this. Hey, from his point of view, but although he won't admit it, guess what? Las Vegas is dead, right? Dead. Dead. Now, as far as the Frias brothers, they have a problem. Even if they're still casino people, they still have an ownership there. So does Ed Roski. A week ago today, Roger Goodell made that statement during the State of the NFL speech about casino owners not owning NFL teams. But he also said stadiums either. All right? State, yes. Yeah, Virginia is also gambling. All right? Well, no, not happening. That's right, John. Not happening. Not happening. The NFL does not want to go in that direction. It's not happening. The ideal for the NFL is the National Football League would like to see a consortium in the Bay Area parlance of tech companies brought together, which we could do in Oakland. And and I might add, <laughs> Richita, that's funny. And I might add that Jim Wonderman and the Bay Area Council have done a wonderful job in bringing together now 120 businesses representing a good, healthy smattering of the tech community as well as the Bay Area. Powerful Bay Area firms, Kaiser Permanente and others, Salesforce. Uh, so there, there is, the NFL, what the NFL wants to see is slowly coming together. Now someone asked, San Antonio deserves an expansion team, but as long as Jerry has influence over the other owners, it won't happen. Well, Barry, it's not just Jerry Jones, it's also Bob McNair. And I asked Mr. McNair about this. Bob had at one point secured the largest radio deal in the history of sports at $32 million as part of his securing the 32nd franchise, the Houston Texans, okay? So think about that. That radio contract, that sphere of influence includes San Antonio. So you pour an NFL team in San Antonio area, what happens? Hey, it cuts the seed corn, right? Not just Jerry Jones's. So there's a huge problem there. Huge problem. Now, um, now, as far as how I feel about NFL expansion, I will say this. The next city that should be on the docket for NFL expansion in five years, because it will be at that level, is Las Vegas, but with a proviso. In Las Vegas needs, in Nevada, needs to add between 5,000 and 10,000 manufacturing or tech jobs. That is, if that, having said that, and applying a five to six or seven year timetable, right, is basically like giving them, it's like giving them the answers to a quiz question already. They're going to get there within that time, Las Vegas is. But Las Vegas, for a whole host of reasons, primarily because the casino industry is slowly drying up. I mean, it's not going to happen anytime soon, but in the next 15 to 16 years, my prediction is that 16 years from now, Las Vegas is going to look kind of like what Reno does today, but on a bigger scale, all right? However, over that period, Las Vegas will have more things to do as a city. It will have matured as a city, and it would have gotten, through technology, it would have gotten his, its water woes solved. That's my prediction, okay? That's a positive outlook for Las Vegas over the next two decades, but no, that's two decades. I'll be in my 70s. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, anyway, oh, anyway, okay, sorry. <clears throat> anyway, you get the idea. You get the idea. Dang it. Anyway, the whole point is that, now, uh, now here's a question. Mark Davis doesn't even have local AM radio station to broadcast radio games. True. Should Las Vegas and San Diego get expansion clubs? San Diego, no. And I'll explain why. Las Vegas, yes, but San Diego, no. Because San Diego, basically, you've got, all right, you've got the Rams and the Chargers in, in Los Angeles. Then you would have, you have the 49ers here and the Raiders, right? And you'd have San Diego. That's a, that's a log jam. Forget it. That's, that's, that's too much. Two by two. Raiders and 49ers up north. Chargers. And Rams down south. That's it. But even bringing the Raiders down in San Diego basically hurts the Rams and the Chargers. Why do that? You know? Why do that? 
Yeah, that's right. Oversaturation. Oversaturation. That's it. And it says, uh, does Mark Davis have 500 million that he said he put in for a stadium? Well, Paul Dog, he doesn't actually have the, the 500 million. The way it breaks down is like this, all right? 200 million, let's 500 million. 200 million comes from PSL revenue, all right? 400 million comes from the NFL G4 loan. The, re the remaining 100 million comes from loan program that was approved January 16th last year at the NFL owners meeting. That's the 500 million, all right? Now, get this. Get this. Get this. In a document that the Raiders produced for this, the Las Vegas fans and Las Vegas market, they said that of the 500 million, 100 million was theirs. So if we apply that to the Oakland situation, right? That that they can take their own 500 100 million, that's 600 million. So really in our case in Oakland they have 600 million. That's the understanding of everyone I've talked to in the Bay Area. Okay. Now, um Arizona is an equation. Arizona has a team. USC is still yes they are. Don't forget UCLA. Um he would only have the 500 million if he stays in Oakland. Actually he'd have 600 million Mr. Gates. Um, and so 300 million from NFL, or do you know something? No, it's not. It's 300 million. That's right, Bill. It's, it's 200 million in the, wait, let's break it down. Okay. 200 million of the 300 million is the NFL G loan program, G4 loan program. The other 100 million is what owners set aside for the Raiders and the Chargers a year ago. Okay. But then the Raiders told Las Vegas people in a, PDF that's online that they had 100 million of their own money. That's what they wrote. Now, if they were just counting the NFL's grant and use of that, I don't think that's the right thing to do. I'm going to I'm going to hope that the Raiders were being straight with everybody and honest. But okay, absent any of the proof to the contrary, we can say 600 million in the Oakland parlance versus 500 million in the Vegas parlance. But yeah, look, that $750 million is being picked away at and picked at like a pinata. It's going away. Now, he says, no, Mark Davis. I remember the USFL Arizona Wranglers. I do too. Hey, remember, hey, uh, John, remember the Oakland Invaders? Grab the lightning with a fist. <laughs> I, I love that one. That was something else. Now, um, I'm going to have guests on in the future. I just want a, a quick question. What, who would you like to see as my first guest? Because what I'm going to do is set this up so that you can watch this like on a Skype or something. I haven't figured out how I'm going to do it, but I'm thinking about it. Any ideas for a guest? Uh, oh, do you think the NFL should enter current overtime rules and follow the NCAA overtime rules? Um, hold on a second. Let me get to that. Uh Okay, um, let's see here. Tim Kawakami, so there's one, okay. Now, as far as, do I think the NFL should in overtime? Yes, I do. I think the NFL should adopt the NCAA rules. Yes. Someone said Lee Steinberg, okay. Uh, Ronnie Lott, Lee's a friend of mine, I can get Lee. Uh, Gary Radnich, why not? Dr. Death. Yeah, I like that one. I like that one. Dr. Death. Dr. Death as guest. I like that. Bouse man. Brian, I like that. Dr. Death. How about how about Dr. Death and Boss Man? That would be cool, right? George Lopez should be your first guy. <laughs> George Lopez. I like that one. Amy Trask. Another great one. I gotta buy her book. Ray Ratto. Ray Ratto. Another friend. I like Ray. And another one from Ronnie Lott. Yes. Okay. I like that. And then John Middlecoff. You know, I'd like to meet John. He seems like a cool guy. I'd like to meet John. That would be fun. And then uh, JT the Brick. Yeah, you know, JT lives in Las Vegas. That's a Las Vegas special. You know? That's a Las Vegas special. That would be worth flying to Las Vegas to do. Um, I got a good nickname, Mr. NFL, for you. Bill Romanowski. Okay. Vern Glenn's a great friend of mine. I like that. Vern Glenn. Vern Glenn. Vern Glenn's another one. Uh, Carol Davis. No, I haven't, um, I haven't heard her do that. Uh, 
and so let's see here. I I have not heard her do that. Now, I am. Um, that's a great idea. Oh, as far as the other issue. Oh, who do you, who would you like to see the Raiders pick as their first round draft choice? What do the Raiders need from your point of view? Defense, offense, special teams. Who would you like to see? Someone else has said Larry Beal. Andy Dolich is another great idea. Andy Dolich. I, I like that idea. Andy Dota. Andy Dolich. Another friend of mine. Another great friend. Another great friend. Raiders, everyone says linebacker. Linebacker. I do remember Bay TV. I do. Linebacker. Middle linebacker. Pass rusher. Middle linebacker. Middle backer. Definitely. Inside linebacker. Any inside, everyone says inside linebacker. Don't you think we need a, a speed wide receiver? Well, no, we don't. Speed tight end, somebody like a uh, uh, cornerback. Cornerback. Somebody like in the mold of a, of a, uh, in the mold of the tight end with the New England Patriots. Gronkowski, something like that. Defense. Well, you know what? We got more than one draft choice, right? It's not an either or. But we need some, you're right, another pass rusher. Interior lineman, we do need that. We do need that. I'm not a fan of two-gapping. I know that Bill Belichick loves two-gapping because he feels that it frees up safeties to handle their pass responsibilities. But for me, two-gapping, you're saying, what's two-gapping? Two-gapping is when you have, you have a, this is offensive line person, okay, right here, all right? And you have a defensive line person. And basically, two-gapping is the defensive line person here tries to block, is blocked by the offensive line person. This is the offensive line person right here, right? And so what happens is that the offensive line person has to hold, the defensive line person has to hold the offensive line person and controls the gap to either side rather than one gap. You control one gap, that's it. You have a coordinated, you know, run defense. The reason why I don't like two gapping is because if you don't have the right players for two gap, if your guy's down, maybe he's sick or maybe he got a little too high or something, you get blown off the line of scrimmage if he's hit just right. But if it's one shoulder, he can fly by the other guy, get in the backfield and make the play. Get in the backfield and make the play. Yeah. Now, someone says the kid from Stanford. How about, well, yeah, how about Christian McCaffrey? If Christian McCaffrey were on the board, would you take him? I would. I would. It'd be a no-brainer. be an absolute no-brainer. Christian McCaffrey for the Raiders, you know? But my point is that, as far as the Raiders' defense, I think a large part of the Raiders' problem isn't interior talent. I think it's how they're coached. And I'm not taking anything away from Ken Norton Jr., on the coaching staff, but part of the way that they instruct their guys to defend has to do with playing two gap. And so a two gap can make a really great interior defensive line person like a Grady Jackson with the Falcons who doesn't play two gap look really, you know, not so great because the person is reading and trying to figure out which way the running back is going to go. And meanwhile, you got this offensive lineman just pushing at him, right? Blocking him, or maybe illegally cut blocking him. You see what I'm getting at? Give him one place to go, fly by him, let him to control the offensive line person. So I really think that the, a large part of the Raiders' defensive problem is scheme rather than talent. They've got a lot of talent there. Because I hear every year, oh, they're going to get this person or that person. And you fit them in that scheme, and it doesn't quite work out right. Now, um, is Wade Phillips coming back to Oakland? I don't know yet. Um, at all. Uh, no, when Wade Phillips, no, Wade Phillips was, uh, no, Wade Phillips is actually signed, he's with the Denver, he's with Denver, so he's not coming back to Oakland, okay, at all. Um, no, he's with Denver, he's still with Denver, he's, excuse me, with the Rams, I'm sorry, he, that's right. Um, Hugh Jarvis has with the Rams, that's correct, that's correct, he's with the Rams. So no, Wade is not coming back to Oakland at all. And how do you feel about the Raiders' new offensive coordinator on that row? I mean, uh, I, I certainly 
someone says, uh, yeah, he's with the Rams, that's right. And another one, hey, since we're losing the Warriors, should we go after the Sharks, build a new stadium? Well, we have a stadium. Oracle Arena is really just fine. In fact, let me explain something to you as far as Oracle Arena. The Oracle, Oracle's problems from the Warriors' perspective are fixable. Now, I'm saying that. Obviously, the Warriors haven't said that, and they don't think so. But John Lacob's, Joe Lacob's son told me at the Bay Area Sports, uh, Bay Area Sports and Law Symposium last year, almost a year ago now, he said that the um, problem was that in Oracle Arena, we have one kitchen. That kitchen was built for $10 million dollars. It was at the suggestion of an organization called Block Consulting. And the reason why I know this is because I have the original document calling for the kitchen. And it's a center place. You've got, you've got the Coliseum Stadium here and the arena. And the kitchen is right down in the middle, all right? What the Warriors want is the, are they have the kitchens right in here. The big kitchens, not the little bitty ones that are on a per-concession basis. But the big kitchens right in the arena itself. And so... Yeah, and so um, that's what they, and so they are, their idea is that if you have the kitchen in the arena, it puts the food delivery closer to the person ordering it, and therefore it's better and faster service. But you can do that in Oracle. Oracle's designed to make, you, you can make those changes in Oracle, still have a hockey organization like the Sharks, bring them up, why not? Hey, look, if the, Warriors and the city of in the county of San Francisco are going to go after our teams. It's about time that we in Oakland went after somebody else's. Don't you think that? Don't you think so? That's just good economic development. Now, um, let me ask you also about NFL Europe. I don't think it can work because of the distance. What do you think? You know, um, uh, yes, Brandon, we're going to build in Oakland. Now, as far as the Oakland Sharks, I like that. I think NFL Europe can work. I really do. I think that what is needed, rather than thinking of it as two teams, as teams that are an appendage, right? You got to have it so that the NFL Europe has five to ultimately ten teams of its own. It has to be a mini league so that you can play and develop a fan base within Europe and rivalries within Europe. And you really need to start with the kids and teach football to the kids so that the kids can understand the game and then develop an affinity for the players. You have to do it that way. But if it's done, if it's done in a way where you've got a team in London and a team in Munich or Frankfurt and they're flying over the United States, that's not going to work. NFL Europe has to be just that. It has to be NFL Europe. So ultimately you have... The NFL Europe teams play each other, right? And they have their own championship. And they play the NFL champion of the Super Bowl, right? And they, they have a real world bowl, like the AFL, right? Okay. Now, do you think NFL makes Raiders share? I think it's doable, all right? I think that's what's going to have to happen. And But until the Raiders stadium is built. That's, that's the logical... Think that's the logical conclusion. That's the logical outcome because you're not going to have, um, you're not going to have a situation where they're going to play in Berkeley because uh, unless the Berkeley neighborhood is bought out and you know given some really great weed, I mean made major league great weed, you're not going to have the Raiders playing at Memorial Stadium on a Monday night football or Sunday night football or any game day. That's just not happening. But uh, as far as a deadline is scheduled for, we have the ENA deadlines. Tomorrow I'll get you a schedule of what's next so you can understand that. This is, I've decided, by the way, if you didn't see my announcement, I'm doing this Sunday through Thursday for one hour. And I've got now roughly 11 more minutes, you know, tonight. And I want to thank everybody for showing up. Spread the word. Let me know about things you want to hear and talk about. This is a lot of fun. It really is. I didn't, you know, I'll come and wonder, can I do for a whole hour show, you know, four 
five times a week, and yeah, I can do it. I can do it, you know? I can do this. I can do this. Now, um, yeah, weed. You said wheeze. Weed. Weed. Um, T.I. Howard, you said, what about Stanford Stadium? Oh, as a place to play? I didn't think about that. You know, it might be worth either, either calling, you know, the Frankfurt Galaxy. I remember that. It might be calling. Um, oh, thank, thank you, John. I appreciate it. And Brian Billo wants to know, why doesn't Nevada just back out of the Raiders Stadium deal? And just go forward with UNLV. Well, that's what they're trying to do. But you can't just, on a dime, unravel that subsidy. It has to be, first of all, an agreement that, among all parties in the Nevada legislature, that that should be done, at least most of the parties. And then you have to write alternative legislation, and then you have to do it. So that's not going to happen, like, tomorrow. Okay, but it, but it will happen. Because there's too much money out there for that not to happen. Now, um, and so, I remember Creature Features, yes. Thank you. I can do it, Barry. I, I really appreciate that. I can do that. And, um, hey, it's too bad Boss Man isn't here. I had to get these guys. Or maybe if I got, maybe if I, maybe if I had Vinny Bonasori as a kid. <laughs> no, Vinny Bonsiori. That's a great last name. Vinny Bonsiori. That's a great last name. What do you think about T.O. not making the Hall of Fame? Travesty. I have met T.O. I've interviewed T.O. I think it's absolutely horrible that T.O. was not selected to the Hall of Fame. And then next year we have, what, Randy Moss, right? So unless we get two wide receivers in the NFL Hall of Fame, it's going to be some time. And I, you know, I have to say this. I have to be blunt. I have an issue with old white guys that didn't play, or old black guys that didn't play sports, or old guys that didn't play sports that just are writing, making judgments over entirely over the players. But the reason why I have an issue with the old white guy image is because it looks like slavery. You've got the old plantation owners that are passing judgment over the black players that played, and, oh, this guy didn't treat me right, and Basically, it's like the modern day variant of the slave owners kind of, you know, looking over their best players or their best, you know, slaves and saying, oh, well, you know, that slave wasn't so nice to me and that slave tried to sleep with my wife and all that stuff. And so I don't want him on my all star team. It's, it kind of feels like that. OK, and it really it does. I, it just it really should be part the fan vote, part the player vote, part writers. And that's really the way it ought to be. It ought to be balanced that way. It's not. It's not. And so what happens is a guy like T.O. is treated unfairly. And that's what's happening. It really is. It's unfortunate for T.O. It's sad for T.O. But, you know, the way you can stop that is to make noise about it. Tell the Bill Plackshees who are on the, I believe, the election committee, right, and also Clark Judge and others, tell them how you feel. You know, let them know. Um, and so, why has Tom Flores and Plunkett not made the Hall of Fame? Another great question. Both should be. Tom Flores, the first Latino NFL head coach? Absolutely. Do you think Las Vegas pulls the money relocation papers will be pulled? Um, yeah, at some point, that's going to it's gonna happen. It really is. And... Um, I really believe you give us more info than reporters. Thank you, Barry. I really appreciate that. I, re I really do. I really do. And uh, I'm going to work on, let's see, we've got tomorrow is our last day for this week, and then we're going to resume on Sunday at the this time. I think this time slot works. You know, 9 o'clock Pacific, 12 midnight Eastern. You know, just got to... Sp help me spread the word, you know, tell people to come out there and, and, uh, we can get the numbers better, which will happen. I just have to keep doing this more often. Maybe, uh, say something, uh, nah, I'm not going to say anything outrageous. It's just not my style. Okay. It just isn't. It just is not. Um, I have to work for NFL network to get in the hall of fame. That's something like that. Yeah. Now it says Zinni, third time asking you this, I'll try asking the question another way. Does Oakland, and the NFL group have a deadline to submit a stadium plan to the NFL. Um, 
Yeah, Bill, it's called as soon as possible, all right? They've already submitted the plan, but, and I'll talk about that more tomorrow. The NFL has sort of been buying time for Vegas, but that was because Adelson is involved. That's dead. That's dead. But the NFL has worked with Oakland. The good news is that Oakland has a plan. Oakland has all the elected officials singing kubaya finally after all these years. We're doing, making the right moves. So now the NFL recognizes that, the commissioner sees it, and it's a better day for Oakland. Do not think that Oakland is not doing anything. That is wrong. Completely wrong. Those days are in the past, I'm happy to say. Oakland is delivering. It really is. Now, oh, submitted to... Eric Grubman has, submitted, has, has seen these plans. They've been going back and forth, okay? The owner's... We'll see them. The trouble is, is that Mark Davis has put, I'm just being honest with you, he's produced a kind of a shield here, all right, between information and what the NFL owners get. For example, did you know that Oakland Raiders Stadium point person, Larry McNeil, was working with Oakland assistant city administrator Claudia Campio for the better part of last year on a stadium development plan. I mean, hard numbers, spreadsheets, cost analysis, everything. All the while that Mark Davis and Mark Bedane were sitting on the SNTIC, okay? The Raiders working at dual purposes, dual tracks. Didn't know that, huh? The emails, yep, I've got them at zenny62.com. Just do a search, okay? Now, did you see Mark's side piece? <laughs> Her name is Sandy. She's a great lady. She's about, she doesn't look like she's 15. She's like, she's about 30. And uh, she is Mark Davis' Super Bowl date, you know, an uh, annually. Very nice. Goes back. She was an L.A. Confidential. Great actress. I understand a great person. I haven't met her yet. Now, Mr. Zinni has always given great stuff. Thank you. How long before the Raiders get the deal in Oakland? Uh, soon. I will say soon, maybe I'll, I'll say next four or five months. But uh, now, does Mark Davis look like, no comment. Now, I like Mr. Davis, okay? Uh, I like Mr. Davis. I'm not going to even, do t you know, do anything like that. It's, uh, no, not at all. Uh, Mark Davis is, I remember when I first met Mark Davis, it was at the Boston NFL owners meeting when, the same meeting, spring league meeting, that the 49er-led team, led by San Francisco 49er owner Jed York, won the right for the Bay Area to host the 50th Super Bowl, which I think was outstanding. Don't know about you. Uh, that's where I met Mark Davis, and we were going to talk afterward after the meeting. I had to catch a flight, so I missed him. I had to leave early, and so couldn't do that. But gracious man. I, I really, when Mark Davis is nice, there are a few better people, okay? I, he's just going through something. What that is, I just don't know. I know, because I know that over the time it feels like he's changed. All right? Now, does Mark Davis still drive a minivan? Uh, uh, I believe he does. NFL needs development league, yes. What does Fortress One change for helping Raiders build a stadium? Well, development revenues, okay? They would take development revenues from new structures established around the stadium. They have a hundred. 105 acres, 108 acres to play with, basically. And if the A's go to Howard Terminal, which it looks like is going to happen, they'll have the keys to the kingdom, literally, all right? Cliff Branch should be in the Hall of Fame. Yes, Cliff Branch should be in the Hall of Fame, okay? And um, with that is 12.58. And, folks, it has been a great hour. I want to thank you all so much, 1259. Mark Van Egan. Hey, thank you all so much. Um, uh, yes, see you, see you Thursday. Thanks. Thank you all. Thank you all so much. I appreciate it. I'll see ya. See ya.